welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm Jean Shafiroff, your host, and today's show is going to be about politics. Politics is giving. It is a public service. With us today is a man who's made a fortune in the cryptocurrency world. He's running for President of the United States on the independent ticket. Let's all welcome Brock Pierce. Brock, so nice to have you on the show. And Brock, what does it take to be a good president? Good question. What does it take to be a good president? I, I think, first of all, being a good person yes. should be a prerequisite <laughs> yes. for president. And then you need quite a few skills. Um, Such as? I think you need vision. Of course. Visionary leadership. Leadership, yes. Need leadership. Uh, I think you have to have a lot of uh, principles, values. Correct. Integrity. Definitely. Um, I think that you should speak truth. Yes. Uh, and I think that uh, you should have a track record of doing good things for others, you know, caring about, you know, others and your country most importantly. I think you have to be a patriot. And how did you decide to run for president and when did this happen? Well, I, it's been a calling for a while. Um, the question was not so much if, but when. And a couple of things. I was in Washington, D.C., meeting with leadership at high levels, trying to understand kind of what are we doing in the context of technology, because technology is changing the world rapidly. And I happen to be on the forefront of innovation uh, in some of these areas, and I know kind of what's happening and how it's going to impact the world. And I went to check, and the, the, the answers I got were very disturbing. Uh, we didn't know what was going on. I always assumed that, that our leadership knew what was happening and that they were looking out for us and that good decisions were being made and that there was a plan. And what I realized is that there's not really anyone driving up top. And I think that we've seen that through COVID as well. This pandemic has shown us that our government doesn't have it all under control. Well, with COVID, I don't think anyone was prepared. Mm -hmm. But uh, now a little bit about your business. What I've read is in, in Forbes, I think Fortune, is that you made a fortune in the Bitcoin world. Can you tell us a little bit about that world? And what exactly is the Bitcoin uh, situation in, in, the, in the United States and in, in the world? And how do you make money with this? Well, so Bitcoin is a digital currency. Think of it as like digital gold. There's a finite amount of it. Um, and rather than being physical, it's intangible, which means you can send it anywhere in the world more or less instantly with low fees. And so it's an alternative you know, store of value. But what we've attempted to do there is create a parallel financial system uh, that doesn't have any sort of central banks. It's based on math and science, you know, in math we trust kind of thing. And what is that called? Uh, Bitcoin. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so uh, Bitcoin was, you know, the technology though that enables it is a thing called the blockchain. So think of the blockchain as the operating system and think of Bitcoin as the first application or the first app. But we can do lots of things with this technology. For example, I digitized the US dollar. So I took the US dollar and I gave it the Bitcoin technology so that it could do all the same things. And that digital dollar is doing $10 trillion a year now in transactional volume. And governments around the world have now recognized that technology can be used to enhance their currency. And so governments and central banks around the world are using this concept now and running pilots. Most importantly is the Chinese government. Uh, the Chinese government has created the digital yuan using this framework, and it's a big deal. And what about the United States? Are we getting involved with um, having our currency dig digitalized? Uh, it's being discussed now. The Fed has mentioned it this year. Uh, it's a little disappointing. You know, America is the capital of innovation, uh, but we are not on the forefront of innovation in terms of our government. And so uh, we're starting, we're behind, uh, but the conversations are at least finally happening because it matters. The U.S. dollar's world reserve status is a big, big deal to our economy. It's the foundation of our economy. It adds 20 to 30 trillion dollars of value to our economy. If something were to happen to the U.S. dollar, it will have a very, very big impact on this nation. So this is an area sure. of focus for me. 
you know, also uh, uh, it, it's worth mentioning the debt problem that we have in this country because that also is a risk to our status. You know, we've got a consumer debt problem in this country, but we also have a corporate debt problem. You know, big companies uh, borrowing and borrowing and borrowing money, creating a moral hazard, and when things go sideways, the government bails them out and socializes the losses at our expense. You know, and the government has a, a, a printing problem. Our debt is at a 75-year high. Our debt has now exceeded the size of our economy. The last time we had debt like this was during, during World War II. Who's going to bail out the U.S. government if we have a problem? You know, this is, this is, this is very concerning, and, uh, and, but there are things we can do. So now, I understand as an, the independent candid candidate or an independent candidate, you now are on the ballot in five states. 15 states, I'm sorry, and are you planning, I mean, do you expect that you'll win uh, the presidency by just 15 states, or, or what is your objective exactly? So I'm 39 years old. I turn 40 in November. I'm exactly half the age of one of the two major party candidates. <laughs> and so time is on my side. True. You know, whatever happens in this election cycle, 2020, I will be actively involved in the independent movement in 2022, in 2024, 2026, 2028, you know, throughout this entire what I call visionary 20s, you know, this decade, I will be very active in this movement. Um, so what can we accomplish in this election cycle? Well, first of all, you don't have to win the election. I don't have to win the election to become president. And how does that happen? Well, so the way that our, our election process works, it's the electoral college vote. And so to win the general election, you need to win a majority. The key word being majority of the electoral college vote. Meaning in a two-party race, if the two candidates were to tie, no one wins. 269 to 269, you need 270 to win. This is what happened in the year 1800, Thomas Jefferson versus Aaron Burr. Or if a third-party candidate like myself were to win one state, no independent candidate has ever won a state. If we win one state, we would make history. It means that a third party would become a major third party this decade. It would be almost an absolute reality if we win a single state. And if it's a close race and we win one state depending upon the state, it means that no one would get a majority. Our goal is to win three states. If we win three states, it is likely that no one will win the election on November 3rd. Well, that's really something. And now, how does it feel to run against such powerful men like President Trump and then Joe Biden. I mean, it must be very intimidating. Well, I don't get intimidated by much. <laughs> um, I've and spent my life doing impossible things, right? I'm not uh, limited by reality as it currently exists. I think outside of the box, the status quo is just that, you know? Things are, look impossible because no one has ever done it before. So now I want to hear about where you stand politically. Are you to the left or are you to the right? Because what, what is America looking for? So all my Democratic friends have always assumed I'm a Democrat. All my Republican friends have always kind of assumed I'm a Republican. Uh, I'm, I'm neither. I'm, I'm really an independent. Uh, I think for myself. And uh, I've liked candidates on both sides throughout the course of my life. Um, and I think that what America needs right now is to rise above partisan politics. This country feels very, very divided between Democrat and Republican, rich and poor, black and white. I mean, it's we are divided and systems of two this is what happens when you have two a system of two like magnets they come together into collusion or they polarize and they separate into total division which is why george washington at his closing address warned us about the risk of political parties our founding fathers their biggest concern for us was that and they prayed that we would never end up with two dominant political parties you know read the history books they warned us never to do this and here we are I want to go back to your upbringing. Now, you grew up as a child actor, and I think you were a star in the Mighty Ducks, the movies. Yeah, Can you I, tell me a little bit about that? And has your acting career helped your politics? I would think, yes. We had uh, Ronald Reagan, who was an actor before he became president, and now Donald Trump has had his own uh, TV show. And, and now we have Brock Pierce, and who's been a child actor Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm from Minnesota, born and raised, and I grew up making commercials and doing print advertisements and playing hockey like a lot of kids in Minnesota. 
and Disney came to Minnesota to make a movie called The Mighty Ducks. And I was lucky, blessed, uh, to book a role as Gordon Bombay, the star of the movie. Uh, Emilio Estevez, but I played the opening of the scenes and all the flashbacks, which is the foundation or the basis of the movie. And how old were you then? I was 10 years old. And that then led me to California, where I made a bunch more movies, eventually starring in some films. And I think the most interesting one in the context of what we're doing now is I made this movie called First Kid, where I played the first kid, or the son of the President of the United States of America, and Sinbad was my Secret Service agent. You know, Bill Clinton and Sonny Bono and others had cameos in the movie. I got to spend a little time in the actual Oval Office at 14. So you had a little practice being president as a young child. Very interesting. Now, uh, we're in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic. If you were to be president, how would you respond and what would you do to get us out of this? Well, one of the things I would have done differently or and would do differently is as we've created stimulus, you know, there's three basic constituents that have benefited from that stimulus. The American people, small business owners, and big business. The biggest beneficiaries of this have been the big business. Small businesses are going bankrupt left and right. I'm, a sm I'm an terrible. entrepreneur, I'm a business creator. Mm -hmm. I have incredible sympathy and I believe in small business. Uh, I believe that innovators and entrepreneurs, along with hardworking Americans, built this country. And I believe all the problems that we have, the solutions are going to come from innovation. It's going to come from entrepreneurs and hardworking Americans finding solutions to our biggest problems. And so it, 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 it just it, it breaks my heart to see Amazon and Walmart growing at the expense of every small business in this country. And every person I've talked to that applied for PPP money almost all of them said they didn't get any or they got only a little bit. Mm -hmm. Basically, most of the money went to the big companies and I think it should have gone to the American people and small businesses first and foremost. And if you, were pre if you become president, would you raise uh, taxes on businesses and wealthy individuals or where do you stand with that? I think that if you double click on every, any aspect of our, uh, our government and our system, there's tremendous room for improvement. Think about it like buying a house. You buy a house and then you're like, do I remodel the house or do you knock it down and build something new? And I think that we should be looking at everything with a blank canvas and, and a remodel and, and compare and contrast. So take our tax system. If you, um, there's no single person on earth that understands the tax code. It's so complicated that there's not a single person on earth that knows it. And even if you call the IRS and ask them for advice, Half the time they're going to tell you to do something illegal. <laughs> this is called, it's time to simplify the system. We should be looking at actual reform, not just do we raise taxes, do we take taxes up, down. We should be making it simple. Something where you could file your own tax returns. You know, it shouldn't be much harder than balancing a checkbook. But we've created a system that is overly complex. And I would occur encourage us to reevaluate the whole thing and see if there is a way to create a more effective system of collecting taxes, an easier process, something that everyone can understand, and something that's ultimately fair to everyone. I understand, and maybe a little less waste. Yes. <laughs> and then finally, I wanted to ask you about um, your vice presidential candidate. Her name is Carla B Ballard, and I don't know anything about her. I read a tiny bit, but can you tell our uh, viewers a little bit about who she is and, and how she would add um, to your uh, candidacy, or how she is adding. Yeah, Carla Ballard, my vice presidential running mate, is an extraordinary woman. Uh, she's a descendant of one of our founding fathers, Aaron Burr. Uh, her has a, a family in history and politics. She's from Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia. Uh, her family has served in cabinet positions for uh, Bush Sr. Uh, she was the president of the Urban League, the founder of the Urban League of uh, nice. Delaware. Uh, she's held senior positions at companies like Ogilvy and Participant Media, and she's uh, been an entrepreneur, civil rights. I mean, uh, proper independent. She's done tremendous things on both sides of the political aisle. I mean, I couldn't come up with uh, a, a better vice presidential candidate. I mean, it's like she's right out of central casting. Uh, and I'm just so blessed that I've had the pleasure of knowing her uh, all these years and, and that she said yes. Interesting. And that she was down to, uh, uh, to run with me. And now where do you stand on uh, the race relations issue in our country? We've had a serious issue with um, 
racial un injustice, and then we've had um, all the looting and violence. And how do you feel, number one, I'm, I'm assuming, like all of us, that you believe in uh, racial equality and you are against racial injustice. And, but um, what about all the looting and, and violence? And what would you do if you were a president to stop that and bring people together? Yeah, I'm, uh, to be clear, I am, uh, I, I'm against injustice and inequality under the law in this country, uh, and I practice what I preach. You know, I invest in businesses that are founded by women and minorities as a focus of mine. You know, I see an imbalance in this country, and so I play my part to restore balance. Um, I also believe in law and order. I believe that law and order is the underpinning of any well-functioning society, so we need that. But clearly, uh, our law and order is not serving us as it should. And so again, there's probably reform, that there is reform needed uh, in our criminal justice system. And I think it begins with training. You know, our police officers probably need to be trained differently if we want a different result. Uh, probably better training, they should be reevaluated. I also think that this is supposed to be the land of the free. Uh, we should be more free, more liberty. I, I'm shocked that our country has more people in prison per capita than anywhere in the world as the land of the free. You know, I think that we should be putting less people in jail. I think we, criminal justice needs radical reform. I think we can do a I better agree. job, but I believe in mm -hmm. law and order. It is essential, uh, but I think we can do better. I, I think we're ready for America 2.0. I think it's time we upgrade the operating system of the United States of America. And if elected, what are you going to do for the American people in the next four years? Uh, well, a, a bunch of things. One of the things uh, that I don't even need to be elected or to become president to do is to upgrade the operating system. Like we, we measure our success as a government, and historically we've done this as a society, uh, and we kind of hold our government account to this concept of growth, or GDP, gross domestic product. The problem with growth is growth doesn't distinguish between positive and negative growth. You know, people being sick and polluting the air and forest fires in California and hurricanes in Gulf of Mexico. All these things create growth, but it's not positive growth, right? It's negative growth. And so we don't distinguish. We need to do a better job of distinguishing between positive and negative growth. I also recommend we start to hold our government accountable and we start to measure our success as a nation by life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So life expectancy in this country is in decline. We should be measuring our success by life expectancy. And if we started doing that, the air would get cleaner, the water would get cleaner, our food would get healthier, everything would start to get better just by changing the unit of measurement. Incentivization, how we measure success matters. That's what we're aiming for. We have to start aiming for new loftier goals. Liberty, let's measure our success by freedom. If we started measuring our success and our police force by freedom and liberty, everything would start to change. For-profit prisons would go away. We'd be locking less people up. We'd actually be solving problems and helping them, not versus imprisoning them. All sorts of things would change. And happiness, the king of Bhutan. Bhutan measures its success as a country by the happiness of its people. And how do you measure happiness? So it, it's, it's a bunch of ways that they've been doing it, but the line there is the pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. right? So sure. we don't guarantee happiness. So, how, But I, what I think we can do is, I, I'm a big believer in this concept of universal earned income. So one of the things that we have to do to stop the looting and stop all of these things is people in this country feel desperate. When you feel desperate, when your back is up against the wall, when you feel desperate, you'll, for, you'll, survival takes precedent over your values and principles. You know, people are feeling desperate. We need to make sure that everyone's basic, basic needs are met so that no one in this country is starving, that everyone has some form of shelter and everyone has access to health care. And we can do this without spending more money. We don't have a resource problem. We have a resource allocation problem. We just need to do things more thoughtfully and more effectively. And Maybe I think there's spend, a way to do that. Spend our money a little differently. Yes. I get it. Okay. Now, you have been very involved in philanthropy. And I've read about your involvement in Puerto Rico and elsewhere. Brock, tell me a little bit about exactly what you've done in the world of philanthropy. This show is about philanthropy. Yeah. So uh, I've been blessed you know, with success and abundance. And with that, we get a choice. Like, what are we going to do with our lives? And I've chosen to devote my life to living in service. 
You know, I want to do as much. I, so I think of life like a game a little bit because I grew up playing games, the game of life. And so the default way that we measure success in life, a lot of people is they measure it by wealth. How much money do you have? That's like the default thing. I found out that there's an options menu in life and in the options menu you can choose a different adventure. I measure my success in life by the positive impact I have. I measure my success in life not by how much money I have but by how much money I give away. And so I'm playing a slightly different game. Well, that's and, uh, very nice. Yeah, and so I chose uh, to do this and then I'm like, okay, where can I go make a positive impact in the world? And as someone that cares about this country, I looked at the United States and said, what part of the United States is struggling the most? and Puerto Rico was that place. And uh, uh, then it got hit by Hurricane Maria. It was devastated. Not all, and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go move to Puerto Rico while the power is still out and see how I can help. And uh, it's been an incredible uh, learning experience. I learned a lot of what not to do and what to do and how to do it. And I think we're supporting roughly 50 different um, grassroots sort of charitable organizations. We're doing some large things. I think outside of the federal government, we're the only organization uh, supporting the uh, um, endangered Puerto Rican parrot. I view that as like a symbol of the resiliency of the Puerto Rican people. Uh, uh, so we're doing a lot of nature preservation. Uh, we brought a million dollars. Uh, we raised a million dollars for COVID masks for first responders mm -hmm. in Puerto Rico as well as other places. And uh, then do you give yourself personally? Yeah, yeah. I, I put up a, a third of that donation and nice. I was able to convince someone else to two to one match me. And so I'm always saying, yeah, I'll, I'll, I try to do matching dollars because I'm a business person. And as a business person, we, we're, we're always- Well, it motivates return, people. Yeah, return on investment. Mm -hmm. So as a philanthropist, I want return on impact. It's still ROI. But for every dollar I give, I want to know that we're getting multiple dollars of impact. And so I'm learning, you know, I'm, I'm still new. I've only been doing this for three years. Um, but, you know, I, I, I should get good at this. And what about a mainland America or in the 50 states? Are you involved in philanthropy here? Yes. Uh, Puerto Rico has been the main focus, as well as indigenous-related causes. So we're doing things to support the Native Americans um, uh, here in the U.S. I've also started expanding my focus into Minnesota. You know, it's the state where I'm from. Yes. And so I had wings. I've left, but I want to, like, you know, be a good kid, you know, a good adult and do good things for the place that brought me up. Um, I also support a number of other organizations in the country related to mental health uh, through my, uh, I've got two foundations, Integro, which is the, uh, the one that's well staffed, mm -hmm. Integro having a, being a Spanish word with two meanings. It means integrity and integration, the idea to, to integrate with integrity. Uh, and then there's the Brock Pierce Foundation that kind of does all the other stuff and um, had a wonderful call today with uh, uh, Nadaba Mandela, uh, Nelson Mandela's grandson, and helping him with a bunch of his causes. I'm trying to help everyone uh, as much as I possibly can. And Which is what philanthropy is all about. You yeah. just don't have to focus in one little area over here. And if you want to be president of the United States, you have to look both within the United States and then out of the United States for sure. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about was um, our young people in our country. Uh, do you view yourself as a good role model? And what, are, what lessons can you teach young people? Well, I, I do my best to be a role model, right? We only have the power to change ourselves. But as we better ourselves, we have the ability to inspire others to be their best selves. And so I take my role uh, and as, as a very serious responsibility that my actions could inspire others. And so I take that responsibility seriously. I spend a lot of time with young people. I've been mentoring and advising, you know, one of the top TikTok influencers and a number of the other top TikTok influencers that are his friends. And I'm doing that because the, the, the next generation is the future. And I'm seeing, you know, that these young influencers that have tens of millions of followers, you know, are teaching other young people. And some of it's good and some of it's not so good. Yeah, which is why I choose the ones that, you know, are choosing to take this role responsibly and understand that what they do is going to impact the lives of others. And, Clearly. And I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed by some of the youth today. Uh, some of the youth today are, you know, they get it and they care and they're trying to send the right positive message to inspire the next generation to be all that they can be. And looking at our youth, what three things in one minute would you suggest to young people so that they can grow? Well, I think as an American, 
first and foremost, register to vote. Forty percent of those people that are eligible to vote in this country do not vote. The youth of this country are the, the, is the sleeping giant. When the youth of this country wakes up to the power they have, that they can change this political system the moment they want. And when they, get, when they start to rock the vote, uh, uh, we're going to get a very different America. So if you are concerned, you know, get engaged, be part of the process. Um, and do you think that this upcoming election with so many mail-in ballots is going to be a fair election? It's a good question. I, I hope so. Uh, the integrity of this democratic process is so important to the legitimacy of this country. I and know that with technology, I could guarantee a fair <laughs> uh, uh, election. Uh, now, and, and so we're working on that. We're working with states around the country. We've got five pilot projects underway using technology that is foolproof and transparent. You have 20 seconds. Two more suggestions to young people. Um, the future is going to happen to you or the future is going to happen with you. Get involved, look inward, decide like what matters to you, what you care about, and stand up for what you believe in. Speak your truth. The fate of humanity is going to be decided by all of us that choose to get involved over the course of this decade. So get involved. Let's create the future we all want to live in. I like that. And finally, if you were to be president, what about an ambassador of giving? And I recommend that you take a look at me. Maybe I can be your ambassador of philanthropy. What do you think of that? I think it's a great idea and teaching people that it's, there's more than ourselves. Like they, the, the greatest gift there is is giving. And, and I, okay. I truly believe the more you give, the more you get. When you give, you get. And this concludes this episode of Successful Philanthropy. I'm Jean Schafferoff, your host. With us today was Brock Pierce. See you next week.